God is good. So where are we going with this? It's amazing how God is tied to service together. Everything you said, what Steve said. Because where I want to get to at the end of this, I, I want to speak about courage. Be strong and of good courage. And I want to show you how many times that command is said to God's people through the millennia, all the way up to us today, is be strong and of good courage. That we've got no right to come to God and say, you don't know what I'm facing right now. He still expects you to respond with strength and in a state of good courage. And I'll show you why all the way through this. But where I want to end up, I want to give opportunity, even as Mike spoke about before, that maybe you felt that you can't kind of, you're a secret Christian like Nicodemus that came to Jesus at night. Or when, it, when the subject comes up at work and, and somebody says, oh, are you a Christian, aren't you? And you blush, man. You get so embarrassed. You're obviously intimidated. This, this, the Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. And I felt this morning that God wants to bust some people out of that state because you've lived under it for so long into a freedom where it's really not a factor and you can just come out and just say, I'm a Christian. Yeah, yeah I'm one of them born again." And take the flack that comes with it, if any. Amen. So this is where I want to go. So at the end of this, I'm going to open up this platform for anybody that wants to come and make a very simple declaration and confession of faith in Jesus. That action by itself can so free you. And you will find there's a residual boldness on your life because something has broken. Amen. So you're with me. So let's... uh, can we switch on the live stream if it's on and make sure you press the sound button because it was forgotten last week. Okay. There's, there's people depend on this, this service. It's uh, so important that we, we get that right. Okay. So be strong and of good courage. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua who led after Moses and he led the people into the promised land. So he was feeling pretty, I don't know, he's probably feeling a bit apprehensive here. Moses is dead. He's the new leader. And boy, what a set of shoes to fill. Man, Moses, who brought the people out of Egypt, who parted the Red Sea with that staff and led them through the wilderness for 40 years. And here's Joshua, the new kid on the block, is going to take over from him. Wouldn't you feel a little bit overwhelmed? Wouldn't you feel a little bit intimidated by that job? To lead them into the promised land. But what is, I want you to see three times in this passage God has got something to say to him. So Joshua 1, verses 1 through to 9. So this is the commissioning of Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. That's a fair bit of territory. And all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Okay, look at this next phrase. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake. Do you hear that? I will not leave you or forsake you. Jesus said exactly the same thing. I'll neither leave you or forsake you. Behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. Who's the you there? You. Me. He said exactly the same thing. Therefore, he says, be strong and courageous. Turn to the person next to you and say, be strong and courageous. And then turn to the other side and say the same thing. Be strong and courageous. And with a little bit of boldness, why don't you just eyeball somebody else and say, be strong and courageous. (laughs) 
So there's the first time. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. How many of you know we're not under law anymore, but we still need to have our noses in the Bible? It's by faith now, not by law. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's something about this this night and day. in, In the morning... You know, have a few minutes in your Bible in the evening. Have have some time in the Word. Just make sure that every day that you're reading some portion of the Word of God. Are you with me? And he goes on and he says, So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. You'll have good success. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Did you get that? It's not a suggestion. It's not that God said, oh, no, you're up against a whole bunch of stuff, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I would advise you and counsel you to be strong and of good courage. No, that is not what it says here. He says, have I not commanded you? God expects this from him. He expected this from Joshua because of Joshua's experience with, with Moses. He expected him to be courageous because God was with him. It wasn't just his his dad holding his hand. It was God Almighty holding his hand. God expected him to be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And as it was then, so it is now. And what he said to Joshua then applies to us now. And God has no less an expectation for you and I to be a people of faith, boldness, and courage than in that day. Amen. Amen. And our connection with God, our connection with God is belief in Him. We will either have faith in God and be strong and courageous, or we'll be in unbelief, and feel, and in that unbelief thinking of, I've only got me to help me, or somebody else maybe could help me. Would somebody help me? Hello? Now, of course, well, there's a human level of this, that when we really are going through difficult times, sad times, my goodness, I've been through more sadness in the last three years than, than I can remember at any other time in my life. But God is with me. He's working all things out for good for those that love God and are called according to His promise. And I most certainly am. So are you. So as we remember the courage of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect our nation and all the the wars that have been fought, to be able to continue to enjoy the freedom and the way of life that, that we've had all these decades and centuries, So as we reflect on the courage of these men, we also need to reflect on the courage that Christians should have. When it comes to this noble character trait of courage, there should be no group of people should exemplify it more than Christians. More than servicemen, unless they're Christians. But nobody should exemplify courage and strength as Christians. Why? Because we have got God on our side. If God be for us, who can be against us, the Bible says. Do you hear what I'm saying? So whether, whether it's on an actual battlefield like some of the guys in our Ukrainian churches, which is, that's been another element of the sadness that we've had to carry these last almost three years now, where we've lost church members out in the Ukraine. And when I say lost It doesn't mean they went to another church like Mike did last week. It meant that they got killed in action. One of our guys, Pastor Sasha, he's down on the front line right now as a chaplain, giving out gospel tracts and Bibles. And he says, man, Rob, they are listening. When I preach the gospel, they listen. You know, they tell us that they weren't, were not in those trenches in World War I. There were not many unbelievers in those trenches. Because with those those soldiers in the trenches, there were also chaplains who were 
preaching the gospel at them. And back then, there were so many people at least understood the rudiments of Christianity. They understand the rudiments of the gospel. So when, it, when they went up and over the trench, and it's like, my goodness, this, this next 10 seconds could be my last one. Quite possibly, many of them, out of their head and their heart, they said, oh, God, help me. Jesus, help me. I, I believe. And God would have saved their soul. You don't need to come up in a church and go through an altar call and you know, say a certain creed or whatever else to become a Christian. You just need to believe in God and cry out to Him and say, God, save my soul. And, and be willing to follow Him and be willing to make the adjustments in your lifestyle to follow God. Amen. So we need to be strong and courageous because God is with us and He expects nothing Less. Can I hear an amen? amen? The other times, all the way through, I've, I've listed some, not all. This is not an ex- exhaustive list of the occasions where God spoke those words to people. But Moses, even before Joshua, Moses commanded the 12 spies who were going to go into the promised land and spy it out. What did he say to them? In Numbers 13, verse 20. He says, Moses, he says to them, be of good courage and bring back some of the fruit of the land. And do you remember what happened? Two believed him and ten didn't. The twelve come back, ten come back, and say, there's giants there in the walls. Oh, oh, we can't take it. Oh, man, we like grasshoppers in their sight. And Joshua and Caleb said, come on, man. Their protection's removed from them. We'll eat them for breakfast. They said they're bread for us. We'll eat them for breakfast. So 10, 12 heard that. 12 heard those words. Be courageous. Be of good courage. Two believed in God. And the other 10, because they didn't factor in God, ended up in a panic attack. Hello. 40 years later, Moses speaks to all Israel before they go into the promised land. He has not yet commissioned Joshua, but he says there in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We've just read what God said to Joshua, yeah? And then we go on a few years and we come to David's commander, commander Joab, as he was leading Israel into a battle against the Ammonites. In 2 Samuel 10, 12, what does David say to Joab? Be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. King David says to his son Solomon, he says in 1 Chronicles 22, 13, As he was about to take over, running the nation, Solomon was going to be king. And David's words to him were this, Be strong and courageous. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. Another king, a man called Azariah, comes to prophesy to King Asa, who had just taken over the throne. And I think from memory, he was pretty young when he did it. And he was charged with reforming the whole nation. That's a big deal. You think Keir Starmer's got a tough job. He had to reform the whole nation. He had to confront all the people who were in the false religions in Israel and pull down all their idols in the high places. That was going to be intimidating. But he says to him, he says, But you, Asa, take courage. Do not let your hands be weak. For your work shall be rewarded. And as I said, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's worth recording what was said to King Jehoshaphat, who also went out against, it was an all, all odds against him. It was just, in the face of it, an absolute disaster, impending disaster. But King Hezekiah, to the people under threat of that vision, of that invasion, he said this, to the people he said, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him. For there are more with us than there is with him. With him is an arm of flesh 
but with us is the Lord our God. I'll tell you, you and God, you're always a majority. In any case, it might look like you're outnumbered. But because you've got God, friend, you're a majority. There is always more with you than there is with anything else. Any situation, any person that comes against you. There's always more. Are you with me? And he says, to help us and to fight our battles. And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Wind on a few years. And here we have Ezra, who was a a scribe. And God is bringing them back into the land after the exile. And he says, And he extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors. And before all the king's mighty officers. This was the foreign king that they had been under suffrage to. And he says, I took courage. Oh, friends, sometimes you've got to take courage. You just encourage yourself in the Lord. I took courage. Why? For the hand of the Lord my God was on me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. And then we go into the Psalms. Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 31 24. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who wait for the Lord. And finally, in the Old Testament. We know the courage of the prophet Daniel, don't we? And God speaks to Daniel directly in chapter 10, verse 19. And he says, O man, greatly loved. Hey, do you know you're greatly loved by God? You're greatly loved by God. O man, greatly loved. Fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. And friend, I pray that as I'm speaking to you, that the Holy Spirit strengthens you if you need it. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Have you ever felt the strength of God come into you in a desperate situation? Man, I have many, many, many times. But you have to reach out to God. You've got to keep praising God and giving him the thanks Thank him that he's with you wherever you go. And friend, in those moments when you feel like fainting, you will find something inside of you because you're born again. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got a new nature. Christ is inside of you and he is no coward. He is no coward. Christ is inside of you. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, I'll just pick out a couple here. We read after Jesus is crucified. His body has been taken down from the cross. And it's like somebody's got to do something. What do you do with the body? And it says, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council. It was the members of that council that decided to crucify Christ. A respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. He took courage and went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and he got it. In Acts 28, verse 15, the Apostle Paul, Luke records this, a little meeting. How many know a little meeting can encourage you? A little meeting between brothers and sisters. Amen. A little coffee sometimes. Yeah. Cup of tea. Maybe a WhatsApp call or a Viber call or a Teams, Google Teams call. Little meeting between brothers and sisters and Christ can really, really make a difference. So we read here, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, they came as far as the Forum of Appius from Rome and the three taverns. To, isn't it amazing that even in that day there were pubs around? <laughs> three, the three pubs. To meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. So we need people, we need God, and we need each other to walk courageously. And let's just, I want to have a look at what the Apostle Paul said about this. I'm going to project this one up on the wall. So the Apostle Paul, think about what he had been through. How many times had he needed to find courage in the Lord? Floating around the Mediterranean, <laughs> shipwrecked three times, <laughs> thinking like, man, my goodness me, I'm g- what's going to go on? But he was incredibly courageous. And he says here in 2 Corinthians 5, 
6 through to 8. And I'm glad he said we. And I don't think he meant the royal we. I think when he said we, he was talking about the company of people around about him at the time. But it's a, it, this is a we that we all should be able to say. This, this is a, we should all be able to make the same statement. Because he says, for we are always. We are always. Somebody say always. always. We are always of good courage. It doesn't mean you don't feel the fear. Do you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you don't feel the fear and the intimidation. It doesn't mean your mind doesn't wander sometimes and you go down doomsday scenarios. It doesn't mean you don't sometimes catch yourself overthinking. But over against the backdrop of our mind and where it goes sometimes, friend, you and I can always be of good courage. If there was no fear, you wouldn't have a need for courage. If there was nothing looming, impending, or threatening, you would have no need for courage. Are you with me? So we're always of good courage. We know that while we are, he says, we know that while we are at home in the body here on earth, we are away from the Lord in heaven. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You've got to believe that God is with you. A lot of the time, it does not feel like it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes it does feel like it. Sean was telling me before when he was getting prayed for here last week, he says the, the encounter he had in the power of God, he says, I've never felt that before, didn't you? Just shaken all the way through. The power of God touched him in a very unique way. God wanted to, I don't know why he was doing that, but he did it. But friend, I found for me, 95% of the time when things are threatening and pending and looming over my life, I don't necessarily feel God. Sometimes I, I hear Him encouraging me as I read the Word of God. As I'm reading the Bible, one of those scriptures might come out. I'm thinking, yeah, be strong of good courage. I can afford to be. Hello. Sometimes somebody might have a, a, prophecy, a prophetic word for me. Somebody's got a prophecy for me. A word of encouragement, yeah. And I, I think, man, that person's got a track record of hearing from God. They've heard from God heaps of times before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some trust in that prophetic word. Yeah. Now, you don't live your life by prophecy. You live your life by faith in the word of God. But, man, prophecy is a great thing to augment the word of God and what the Holy Spirit's already been trying to say to you, but you haven't quite got it yet. That's why so often when you get a prophecy, you think, oh, yeah, that kind of resonates a bit. I've been thinking like that. But prophecy kind of pushes it over the edge so you believe the thing. You believe that in a direction that's there by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So he says we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Well, anybody would, wouldn't they? <laughs> How about we just read this out, every one of us? I just feel in the Holy Ghost we need to get something out of our mouths by way of believing in the heart and speaking with the mouth. Come on, together. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Amen. So what kind of circumstances might you find yourself in when you need the courage of the Lord? Well, adverse circumstances, really adverse circumstances, pain, where, where there's been pain in your, your heart, there's been betrayal, there's a whole bunch of stuff, whole... So many situations, that's when we need to have courage. But you know, it's interesting. So many people I meet, so many Christians, the minute something goes wrong, it's a devil, it's a devil, it's a devil. I have learned this, that it's more likely to be God disciplining us. Because there's a long way between who I was and being like Jesus. 
There's a whole lot of training that's got to go on to make Rob selfish, self-centered, Rob smiley, don't care about anybody else, to have a new heart and a new spirit and a renewal of his mind to be able to get to a place where he can be the pastor of a church. The journey has been long and exceedingly painful because what God tells us to do, commands us to do, Jesus said you need to pick up your cross and follow him. You've got to pick up that cross. What is the cross about? It's about self-denial. Our whole world has got to go from being self-centered to God-centered and others-centered. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's got to be God-centered and others-centered, especially your family. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you with me? So we need courage. Especially when God may well be dealing with a thing he will always be dealing with. Human pride. Self-sufficiency. Self-reliance. Self-centeredness will always bring the loving, heavenly discipline of a heavenly father. And the thing is, we go, what's going on? What's go-? God's saying, I need you to get off the throne of your life. You said you would. I need you to pick up your cross of self-denial and live for me and less for yourself and for others. That's what you signed up for. I didn't read the fine print, Lord. Well, you should have. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Man, how many of you young fathers in here? Young fathers, you get, you've, you've got little kids. Or maybe you kind of, the kids are 10, 12. I don't know about you guys, but for me, self-centered, do what I want to do, everything revolves around me. I was quite the narcissist. Everything around about me. And I, I remember God worked through our first child, Rebecca. Because what the cross Well, it's not what it doesn't do. It's an outworking of the cross in your life. I'll tell you what. When that first kid comes along, that was painful. I I loved the little little Rebecca. That's my eldest daughter's name. But man, the shift from being self-centered to being Rebecca-centered. I said, what do you mean we can't go to the beach? It's, 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 It's hot. This is Australia. It's, it's 35 degrees. That's the whole point. She'll burn. And then the mother gets involved. And oh man, when mother-in-law gets involved. <laughs> yes, yeah, she can't go. <laughs> she might be watching. God bless you, Mar- Margaret. <laughs> can't go there. Can't go here. You've got to be home to watch a baby. Oh man, the pain. And that was how God was somehow using my first child. It took three children to get me less (laughs) self-centered. What about you? (laughs) Add some more. (laughs) Have you know God's got his ways and means committee? But friend, let's not be too quick to blame the devil. My first, when stuff, when pressure comes, I say, how... Okay, what are you trying to outwork in my life here? What, what other character quality are you trying to develop in me? Are we going to a new level through this? A new level of patience? A new level of faith? A new level of empathy and compassion? A new level of just, wow, trying to be a better pastor? God has a ways and means committee to work out that heavenly discipline. If you think, where's that in the Bible? Well, let's have a look at it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through to 13. I'll tell you what, I am glad most of the time it's not the devil. And even if it is, he's on a leash. You hear what I'm saying? He's on a rope. But I find this passage of Scripture is largely forgotten in some quarters of the, the church. I don't mean this church, but well, maybe it is, but not by me. But in Christendom in general, 
There's a teaching that says if you just get enough faith, you won't have problems. I think, really? Hebrews 12, 5 to 13. The writer to the Hebrews, who were just about, some of them were thinking about quitting and going back to Judaism and the old law. And he says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when you're reproved by him. Don't quit, don't faint. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastises every son whom he receives. And you daughters don't miss out either. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Well, sadly today. If you, if you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Now, this, you need to qualify that because Paul says, Fathers, don't break the spirits of your sons. There is a way to discipline without breaking the sons or daughters' spirit. You hear what I'm saying? He says, Shall we not more be subject to the father of spirits and live? Verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good. Everybody say good. That we may share his holiness. And let me tell you, if you allow all of this to work towards holiness, holiness, there's a great equation. Holiness equals happiness. Because all the miseries in human life spring from sin. Self, everything to do with self is sinful. God says, pick up your cross and follow me. Live by my son's example, who died on a cross for us, others. Pick up your own cross and follow me. And God will work out all this through his heavenly discipline so that we share in his holiness and therefore we share in Christ's happiness. Happiness. What's the old song? Julie says, don't go there. Was it Ken Dodd saying that? <laughs> happiness, happiness, the greatest gift that I possess. I thank the Lord that I've been blessed with more than my share of happiness. Ken Dodd was a comedian, a clean one. <laughs> I just remember his, his face, do you remember? So friends... This is a more important equation than Einstein's E equals MC squared. Holiness equals happiness. And that's what God's working out. You might think, I'm not happy now. You will be if you have faith. Hello. Let me just check the time, which we've probably run out of. What is the time? Eight minutes two. Okay. Right. And I've dropped the page. And everybody's saying, I hope he doesn't notice it. <laughs> oh, he's found it. Oh, no, he's going to go on and on and on. <sighs> now, I'll bring it to a close because um, I'll let me finish what I was reading. For they disciplined us for a short time, i.e. this lifetime. They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed... I've got so much sweat running in my eyes. My eyes are stinging. I can hardly see the page. Why don't you take off your jacket? That's a good idea. Let's finish what we were reading. Eh? It says, verse 11, For the moment, all discipline seems painful. Can anybody say amen? Rather than pleasant. But later... It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. But will you be trained by it or just fight it all the time? Peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet 
So that what is lame, I'm hurting, Lord. That what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Can anybody say amen? And finally, as Mike so eloquently put it, Mike, come on up here and let us see your t-shirt again. It says, enjoy Jesus Christ. Thou shalt never thirst. That's a good t-shirt. I've seen others of you guys wearing those kind of t-shirts. Yeah, you walk up the street and it's like you're probably conscious of a few eyes coming, zeroing in on that chest. What's that? Oh, yeah. What did he mean by that? Wow. Thanks, Mike. But friend, it takes I don't know if you notice this, but it takes courage to be a, a real Christian. It doesn't take any courage to be religious, but it takes real courage to be a Christian. And I want to show you something here. From the very end of the book, the Bible, chapter 21, there's only one more chapter after that. And it's a picture of when it's all said and done, and we're going to go into what the Bible and theologians call the eternal states. And he says this, the Apostle John in a vision, he received all this in a vision in the Isle of Patmos under extreme persecution from Emperor Domitian. Around about AD 96 this was written. And he says, then I saw in a vision, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. There's a lot of symbolism in this, which I haven't got time to go into. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, this is Christ. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, write this down. That's why we're reading it. Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha. You wonder where the Alpha course gets its name. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty, spiritual thirsty. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. God is the source of spiritual life. Yep. Yeah? But look at this verse here. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But look at this. But as for the cowardly, wow, what are they doing in here? As for the cowardly, the faithless, those two are connected. The detestable, for murderers, the sexually immoral, all the ones that sleep around, sorcerers, and that's drug taking as well, the Greek word pharmakia, the use of drugs to get into the occult. Idolaters and all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Man, when you read those words, those are serious words. What he's really saying, I've checked all my commentaries. What he's saying there is, is that so many were offered the chance to follow Christ and spend eternity in heaven. But they didn't take courage. They were afraid of what would happen. And this is very apt because the church here was persecuted at this time under the emperor Domitian. That's why John was on this island, because he'd spoken up the word of God. And he'd been persecuted and placed in exile on this island out there near Turkey somewhere. And what he's saying is, is so many had the opportunity to respond to God, to follow Christ, but they were afraid. And that's why he says, because outside, outside the city, there's the cowards 
And the next one is the faithless. In other words, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe that God was with them, that God could be with them. They didn't believe that He would walk with them all through their life, persecution or peacetime. They didn't believe it. So therefore, because they were faithless, they were cowards and gave into that. And eternity will be in another place than they would have hoped. Jesus said, Jesus put it this way. In Matthew 10, and this is my last verse, Matthew 10, 32 to 33, Jesus said this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. Yeah, he's one of mine. He's been following me all his life. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who's in heaven. Wow. That's pretty straight, isn't it? But friend, 90% of what I've been speaking about are quotes from the Old and New Testament of how God is with us. Amen. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, oh man, it's all right for you. I, I don't know if I could cope. I, I don't know how, I'd, if, if I came out as a Christian, if I, what would my friends say? Oh, I lost five of mine for a while. God put them all back in time. I've put up with ridicule and abuse. But nothing, nothing like my friend, Pastor Christopher, in Bangladesh. Where I've had letters this week from him. Please pray for me. We've baptized a few people in secret. If it's ever found out, they'll kill us. He's operating in a Muslim country. We usually don't have to face that, do we? But friend, if you're in this house today, and you're thinking about following Jesus... I want to tell you, He will be with you all the way. And you and He are a majority. And you will find, even if there's rejection and ridicule and a bit of this and a bit of that, you will find comfort in God. You will find strength in God. You'll find courage to keep going. I did. Amen. So I want to to open up this altar to two groups of people. On this side here, just around about here, I want to give anybody here who is a Christian, maybe like Joseph of Arimathea or, or Nicodemus, and you're kind, of, you're kind of coming to Jesus at night. You're, you're kind of a secret believer because you're worried about what people would think. But friend, Nicodemus, in the end, he made a stand for Jesus. Amen. He got touched by God. And he brought his faith out into the open, probably at great cost to himself. So I want to open this up to anyone that would say, yeah, Rob, I'm sick and tired of being intimidated. I'm I'm sick and tired of kind of blushing and being embarrassed about Christianity. I I, I kind of want to come out. And one of the best ways to do that is to come up and just say, you might say, what am I going to say? Just something along the lines of, Lord, here in front of all these witnesses, I declare you to be my Lord and Savior. And I will follow you all the days of my life. Something as simple as that. If that's you, come on out of your seat. Come on up here. You'll find, I'll tell you, you'll find something break off your life. For anybody else, and you're not a Christian yet, but you're thinking, I've been thinking about it. Okay, well, the Bible says weigh up the cost, and I've kind of covered some of that. But if you're in that place where you say, yeah, Rob, I've been thinking about it for a while. It's a big decision. Yeah, it's the biggest decision you will ever make. If you are willing to come out forward, and I'll lead you in another prayer that you can be a Christian. So as Julie plays, how about we stand up right now? As Julie continues to play, if that's you and you want to receive Christ today, come on forward. I'll lead you in a prayer and in the process you will be making a confession of faith because you believe in the heart, confess with the mouth, you shall be saved. But for the people over here and you want to make a public confession of Jesus, it's like you've kind of been undercover. It's like it's time to come out. I want you to come forward and I will lead you. Good on you, Lucy. So you need to come over this side because you're already saved. Good on you. Anybody else? This is very freeing. 
What you're actually doing is you're publicly identifying with Christ. Amen. And you will find a newfound boldness and courage. Is there anybody else needs to come forward? Anybody else needs to come and get saved? You need to get saved this morning. Eternity is real. All these issues, they're, they're eternal issues. What you do with Jesus is the, simple, is the biggest decision in your life. To believe in Him or airbrush Him out and hope it doesn't matter. No, it matters. It matters. All right. How about you come up here and, uh, ladies, come on up here and, uh, yeah, good on you. Oh, wow. 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 So you want to stand here or over there? I'd... <laughs> Come on up here, Aiden. All right. Thank you, Jesus. You can come up too. Come on. That's great. So you're here because you want to put your trust in Jesus to become a Christian, yeah? I don't even know who I'm talking. Who? I know you're a Christian. This is my sister. Yes, your sister. sister. Yeah. And Olivia. So all of you, you and two. All right, okay. So all of you want to receive Christ. It's a, it's a big decision. Yeah? If you make it at this age, 62. No, if you make it at this age, it would be the best decision you could make for your whole life. Amen? You too. Okay, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer, okay? This is called the salvation prayer. It's you talking to Jesus because he's alive, he's well. We believe he died, was buried, raised the third day. And he did that to forgive us of all our sins, to wipe our past clean, to take our record of sinful actions and thoughts, scrunch it up, and put his record in its place. So you can stand before God as as righteous and as holy as Jesus is. That is amazing. And as I said before, holiness equals happiness. Come on, mum, come up here. Mum's crying with good reason. All right, I'm going to ask you all to hold hands together, yeah? And I need you to, I'm going to give you the words to say. That's all I'm doing. I'm giving you the words to say. But you use the words to pray to Jesus, to talk to Jesus. He's listening. You ready? Here we go. So close your eyes. So don't just repeat my words. Use them to look to Jesus, who's going to save your soul this morning. You ready? Dear Jesus, say that out loud. Pray it out loud. Dear Jesus, yeah, I believe in you. I understand why you died to make a way so I could know you I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong every sin on the books wipe it out and write my name in your book of life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul today. I take my first steps with you, and I need you to give me courage, and I need you to give me strength to begin my walk with you. Lord, I'm going to need a new heart. It's all right. A new spirit. So I can live this new life. Let me be born again right now. Holy Spirit, come and move in to my heart. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow.
Congratulations. 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 Wow. That is awesome. I'm sure mum can look after you all. Hi. You come and stand with them, eh? Wonderful. So this is about you guys already being saved. Yep. You're already a Christian? Good. You want to be bold all the time. Well, this is, this is not some of the time. Yeah, we go through those moments, don't we? Every time we go out in the street on a Sunday, I kind of have to push through something. But it's not as bad as it was at the start. So I'm going to give you some words to say that causes you to identify with Jesus, yeah? So this is you speaking up for him, yeah? It's a public confession of faith. Amen? So close your eyes and say... I'll declare these words out loud, nice and loud. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, by the Holy Spirit's grace, I stand here this morning before these witnesses, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I declare that you are my Lord you are my Savior, and you, I trust, that I am a Christian, that I'm born again, and I live for you. So, Lord, I identify myself with you. I follow you. Amen. Let me pray for you. Can I, is it okay if I... Father, I take authority over intimidation fear of man, all that would cause someone to live a closeted Christian life. Father, I break the power of that. Lord, I break the power of that on Lucy's life. Jesus, I break the power of that on my sister's life here. Fear and intimidation. We break your power. And Lord, we pray it's replaced with a holy boldness, a strength and a courage in their hearts, clothing their minds, Always there at the tip of their tongue to give a witness for you, to own up, to speak up, to nail their colors to the mast. So, Father God, let their true colors shine through in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. That is wonderful. C congratulations. Well done. Well done. Lucy, this is a big transition time for you. You are transitioning from one style, lifestyle to the other. Thank you, sister, for coming forward. Well done. Let's give God a huge clap this morning. Thank you, God. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you for those souls that got saved two minutes ago. Thank you for those ones God have made a decision not to give in to fear. We thank you that you have now, well, not now, you did before, but Sometimes fear comes around, the fear of man. But you say, as Paul said to Timothy at Ephesus, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Thank you for the power. Thank you that we love Him more than we fear Him. And I thank you for a sound mind that feels the fear and does it anyway. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. God bless you.